Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone and welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson and joining me now is the great Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Jerry Dehovic. Thanks for being here, and I'm looking forward to coming in to give our residents a monthly update. Well, my pleasure, Liz. Thank you for having me. It's, sir, uh, it's good. My honor to be here with well, you. We, we're great. We're, it's great to have you. You were sworn in in December, and how's it been so far? 2014. We off to a good start. And how about you as serving as mayor? How's it going? It's going great. I'm going to just segue for a second. I do want to thank you um, and Mark Dottie and and Maria Sorrell for the great job that you do. You know, you you provide a great service to the residents of RPV from uh, you know letting them know the news and the goings on and some some entertainment. But you're very professional in what you do and uh, um, interesting and entertaining at the same time. So I just wanted to thank you for what you do. This is, this is a great service and we get a lot of positive feedback on RPV TV and you and the rest of the crew. So thank you for that. Um, and before I answer your question too, I do want to say, as I often say, uh, that serving on council for me personally is, is uh, uh, really an honor and a privilege and, and even more so as mayor. And I'm, I'm very humbled and thankful for uh, the confidence that the residents have instilled in me and that my colleagues have instilled with me in selecting me mayor uh, during the reorg December 3rd and you know I can't believe it uh, in about 10 days I will have been mayor for two months already and it just seems like uh, time is flying very very quickly. Uh, in answer to your question whether or not we're off to a great start or a good start you said I think we are off to a great start. Um, very very busy, busy being the operative word. Uh, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. You know, I think most residents see what goes on, residents see what goes on at the meetings, uh, but there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Meetings and different consultants and a lot of reading and a lot of educating. And, and I pride myself in being uh, as informed as I can be. And I think you know my colleagues, I'm sure, work the same way. But uh, we're off to a great start. We have a lot going on. Uh, we're going to talk about some of that here in a minute, and uh, but but you know RPV is in good shape all the way around. We've got a great city, uh, great residency, and uh, uh, we're working hard to make that better if we can. And I just also want to jump in. You said how much you appreciate us, and I just want to reiterate when you talk to residents, and we always say that what all you council members are doing technically is almost volunteers in the community. Absolutely, um, it's you, you know you you have you run your own company. So you have a lot to manage, and this is a full-time job with another full-time job and a family. So people also need to take that into consideration. It really is. You know, it, you can make it a full-time job. You know, and uh, and the, the hours that are put in almost makes it as so. But, well, when you but just give those reports, if, the, if if when the residents are watching <coughs> the meetings, which we want to remind everyone, first and third Tuesdays of the month. That's right. You know, if you can't get up to Hess Park to watch it live, it's on the channel here always, and. Um, and, and course, on the internet too. Yeah, so it's, the, yep, we've got it all going on so people can stay connected because we want an, our community to be engaged and know what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. So but you, you're going to do that. So the last couple council meetings, let's just start with your focus has been, you're working on um, goal setting exercises, what you're calling it. Talk about what's happening with this and what, what's ha what, what you're going to accomplish. Sure, thank you for that. And, and when we first, when I was first elected in 2011, this council set out to identify explicitly and spent a lot of time uh, identifying priorities and goals in 2011 and 2012. We came back and modified those um, for, for uh, 2013. And what we're doing right now is going through a very similar exercise. We have a facilitator that's helping us out and we're taking a little bit of a different tact. We're actually bifurcating priorities versus goals because, you know, a priority, and I'm, I'm going to enumerate some of those here in a minute, is different than a goal. A goal is a specific item that has a specific time frame, um, has a specific manager, and may need some sort of budgetary allocation to get done. A priority is much more global uh, in, in nature. For example, when we started, we had 10 different priority categorizations, and, you know, obviously, the first two pretty much go without saying number one is public safety, number two is infrastructure. I think any, any public servant, especially in municipal government, would recognize those as being the top two, and as is the case with Rancho Palos Verdes, public safety and traffic issues is priority number one, public infrastructure priority number two. Interestingly, this council thought it very important that citizen involvement uh, be priority number three. Uh, ahead of some of the others which you're about to see and we, we are as a council uh, very interested in what the public has to say and getting them involved on the commissions committees and getting all this input. 
Uh, number four is a, is a mouthful, but it's government efficiency, accountability, fiscal control, transparency, and oversight. Basically dealing with the money and, and providing open government and transparent government, making sure that, that everyone knows what's going on and everything's done in, in very much in the public eye. Uh, fifth, and no, no less important, is city parks, trail system, and recreational enhancement. And fourth is intergovernmental issues, and that, that really deals with um, how decisions at the state level and national level affect what goes on at RPV, which is also very important. But to get back to what I was saying earlier, for example, uh, item number one, I said public safety and traffic issues. That's a priority for us. That's not a goal. Underneath that priority will be the goal of, for example, uh, one of the things coming up are, are cameras at the primary entrances to our city. And we're going to work in conjunction with our sister cities to see if we can uh, maybe come up with something collectively. We're working with the sheriff right now, but again, that's a specific item. We're looking at a specific time frame, trying to get that done by year end. Um, um, we know who's going to be in charge of it, and there's going to be some cost associated with that. So it's not a priority, it's a goal, and that's what this council is working on. <clears throat> through these, these, these laborious exercises. We've been through two meetings, actually three thus far, and it'll probably take two more for us to get it right. And you have this facilitator. Is that making a difference to help you just kind of, there's a lot to manage here. There's a lot to manage, and, and, and it really does help. You know, some would argue, and I think we could do it on our own if we really had to, and, and I think we're, we're skilled enough to do that, but, but history shows and, and experience shows that Having a third party, a disinterested third party, to get everybody focused on where you want to go really does help. But that third party has a lot of experience in municipal government. He does, and he was actually a, a county executive and as a consultant and has a, a long history in doing this. So we're, we're right. very thankful. That's Mr. Alan it's Coleman. It's always nice to have an extra set of eyes and ears that, like you say, would be objective. Be and before you move on, may I interject? Sure. One, one other thing that we talked about is we re readdressed uh, three primary macro level and strategic uh, plans and we, we readdressed our vision statement, uh, our mission statement, and our core value mm -hmm. statement. And, and those are, are, you know, some would think, you know, esoteric and pie in the sky and what have you, but you really need to define what you want to do. For example, um, you know, our vision statement. Our vision statement talks specifically about what are the guiding principles of the city over a period of time. Some cities choose three years, some choose five, 15, what have you. We chose in perpetuity, and I'm just going to read it because I think it's important to, for people to understand what are the guiding principles of the city and city government. And that is to achieve the highest quality of life in Rancho Palos Verdes by honoring the vision, principles, and goals of the city founders as identified in the general plan, because we have an award-winning general plan, while adapting to future needs, challenges, and opportunities. Very simple, but that is our, our, uh, our guiding principles going forward in the future. Second would be a mission statement, and that mission statement um, basically talks about what are our strategic goals going forward for the city and, and our mission, the mission of the city and the city government is the city of Rancho Palos Verdes is dedicated to providing residents, businesses, and visitors with exemplary municipal government and services while preserving our low density, low tax, and semi-rural character, very important, inclusive of our natural resources and open space, thereby enhancing the quality of life. So these are very high level and, and strategic items that, that are principles and guiding principles for us going forward. And finally, um, we have what, what, what the core value statement is, and that really defines the conduct of the city and how the members of municipal government are to conduct themselves and the staff, and that's a very simple statement. The primary purpose of Rancho Palos Verde City Government is to provide excellent, professional, and high quality service. And that's what we do, and if everybody remembers that, uh, we'll be that much of a, a, a better city going forward in, in how we govern the city. And so. so all the viewers out there that aren't living in RPV, when they hear that, they're going to want to move here. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's all it's all pretty, you know, incredibly high standards. And I think I, when we always keep, keep hearing, especially last year with the city's 40th, about, you know, is the founder's um, dream and vision still here and realize, I think that that's so important that we don't forget where that we came from and this whole idea of preserving the integrity of our community continues. And then... We even have the same number of residents, basically, as when this we community do, founded. Yeah. How, how amazing is that? It really is amazing. And, you know, we're, everyone always says we're pretty much at build down. I think we started with 41,000 and change, and we're right under 43,000 now. And that number is probably not going to change much in the future. But, uh, you know, the, the, not only the 
citizens of RPV, but many others on the Hill, and we don't need to get into that now, really stepped forward and put something that, that is a, an award-winning uh, general plan that is the basic blueprint of our city going forward. And we do want to honor that. And we do want to remember that. We're basically undergoing uh, a, a, I don't want to call it a revision, an update to the general plan. And that's going to be coming forward to council here in the not too distant future too. So right. we're going to be very judicious and, and very uh, careful on how we tinker with, with perfection, as it were. And just to wrap up the goals, because we have lots more things yeah, to cover, sure. anything you want our residents to know? I don't know if, they're, if you're getting feedback and input from the community on this one? You know, we would, we would love more input and feedback. Uh, the goals are enumerated. They're, they're online. You can go online and look okay. at the city's agendas and see what we're looking at. And we talk about them uh, at the meetings, but I would welcome any input. Uh, some of the things you're going to see, infrastructure, I said, was... I'll call it uh, priority number 1A, safety and infrastructure, because people need to be safe. And number two, they need, you know, the streets need to work, the sewers and you know, storm drains, all these things you know, need to work. Um, we are just about to receive an infrastructure uh, assessment, a grading of all our infrastructure and a report card, as it's called. That's coming up in very short order. And that's going to segue and, and assist us in coming up with an infrastructure management plan uh, which is very cutting edge. You know, this city in, in researching this is head and shoulders above the rest in implementing such a plan and taking it to, to a, a very advanced stage and in, in incorporating that all into our GIS system, which will allow us to put everything in a, a single location for staff to use, the public to use, and all historical records to be preserved. So uh, hats off to, to Les Jones and, and city staff for putting that together. We are Again, my goal, and I've said this before, is I want Rancho Palos Verdes to be an example. I want us to be a template. I want people to look and say, look how RPV does it. That's how we should do it. And as far as infrastructure goes, the grading and the management plan, we are going to be uh, you know, a benchmark mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, um, the uh, focal point for people to come see how it should be done. Well, you're definitely setting the bar here, uh, higher here. And, and as far as making the standard for the community, just look what you did in the issue of transparency. We always are talking about that. That's right. And what you did with in terms of what was going with you know, salaries and compensation. Now you've got uh, a template, I guess, that, that was created in the past year, right? That Absolutely. could be looked at as a statewide example on how you show your community you know, just some things that the community deserves to know. And as a matter of fact, you know, we're talking about what we do behind the scenes. We've got at least two more meetings on that before that gets, gets brought forth to mm -hmm. the public. We have to vet it and make sure it's exactly what we want. But it is, it is definitely cutting edge. And when we're done with that, uh, I think the city will probably draft a letter to uh, Mr. Chang, the state controller, yeah. and say, this is how it should right. be done. If you want true transparency, he made, you know, good steps in the right direction there. But um, what we're doing is, is exponentially better. Right. So. One of the things when we have you in here as mayor to update the residents, if they don't have the chance to sift through, you know, <coughs> the three or four hour meetings plus, three or four hours plus, right. um, just the key things that are coming up on your agenda, things you're deciding. Mm -hmm. A big one, the last meeting you just had at the end of January was, um, we're going to go into um, that, was uh, with Marymount College. Right. They were before you dealing with their athletic field approval process. Would you explain to the community? What's going on with that topic? Sure. What we had um, <clears throat> at our last meeting was a, a public hearing to get comment, comments, public comments, uh, on what they call a draft mitigated negative declaration. And I'm going to try and keep this very high level. Called an MND. MND. <laughs> and I'm going to refer to it as an MND going forward because it's a tongue twister. Right. Um, but uh, in 2010, the city approved uh, the CUP, the conditional use permit for Marymount and, and their entire plan, which was, which was broken down into three phases. Part of that plan included an athletic field. And in October of 2012, Marymount decided that they wanted to change what was approved. And what they did is they made an application for a CUP change. When that happens, uh, that triggers um, um, some action under CEQA law. Now, CEQA law, the California Environmental uh, Quality Act, is, is very, very complex. There is, there is a, you know, attorneys that specialize in that area, consultants that specialize in it, and it's very, very complex. But there was an environmental impact report that's one of the requirements of CEQA on the original Marymount plan. Now, with Marymount requesting the revision, one of the avenues that, that uh, staff uh, and the applicant can pursue is if, if you don't have 
under CEQA law, and I'm not going to dissect that right now, what, what they deem significant or substantial environmental issues that cannot be mitigated, that would technically trigger a new EIR. It's the opinion of staff and our um, consultant. consultant, thank you, um, that an EIR, a new EIR is not necessary and we can go through the MND process. And part of that process is they put out a draft MND and they identify environmental issues that may be substantial in nature, but they can be mitigated, hence the name mitigated right. negative declaration. Um, so they put that document together. It was a draft. They put it out to the public and there was some back and forth on um, the draft itself, which we don't need to get into, but uh, um, we allowed for public comment period, uh, both verbal comments and written comments, and we took comments on Tuesday, but interestingly enough, today was in fact a deadline, and I saw that there were uh, a whole host of comments coming in up until the 11th hour at 5 o'clock today. So we're taking all this resident input. There is a debate <coughs> whether or not an EIR was more appropriate than an MND. Uh, we're not going to get into that. Our experts, our legal counsel, and uh, others tell us that's not the case, including our consultant. So um, we Can are. Can I for a minute? So, yeah. so the pub public that's watching, mm -hmm. what, what, what would have been so bad about the EIR? It's just more lengthy of a process. It's, it's more involved. More or? involved, more costly. We've spent, you know, right. they, they made the application in October 2012, and it's now coming okay. in front of us now. So there's a, there's a time factor there. A lot more money, a lot more time. And there is an argument on both sides, and I don't want to opine whether an EIR okay. was more appropriate than an MND. This is where we are. This is what we're going forward with, and in sometime in March, I think it'll be the first meeting in March, if, if staff and the consultant are able to address the concerns, which is another interesting point. And when you have an MND, normally comments are taken into consideration. If you had a full-blown EIR, by law, they, they would have to address each of those specifically in a written response. Our staff and our consultant will address each of those in a written format, which is above and beyond. Uh, so people can understand the thought process behind their recommendations. When that's all said and done and we get a final MND in front of us, the council will then deliberate. We'll probably, you know, we have to decide whether we're going to accept the final MND, which is one decision, and then that brings us to the real decision, it which is approval, or not, of approval or not of the field and, and the change in the CUP. So those are two distinct different things. and. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a contentious issue out there. It's a lot to figure there. out. It is. It's like I said, CEQA law is very, very complex, and, uh, but I think we're, we're marshalling through it very well thus far. So stay tuned for that one. Stay tuned. It's coming up. And if you're, if you're interested in, in hearing about it, all the documents, the M&D, everything's on the website. Everything, we got a great website. It's just somebody should just go out there and just roll through that thing. There's so much information out there. And if you're interested, whatever topic it right. may be. And of course, our website, people are watching, is for palaceverdes.com slash rpv. That's right. That's how you get there. And it's amazing what's on there. Exactly. It really is. And I'm going to refer to Anything some of that Anything else you want to add about just this whole process dealing with Miramont for our residents to take in and you know, that are watching I, these meetings? I, I just would ask that people, people understand that uh, you know, reasonable people and good people can differ in their opinions, and it's a very contentious issue, and, and you do have... Uh, neighborhoods that are that are much more impacted than somebody on the west side of the right. hill and they have opinions too but there there's a lot to consider here and and you know this council and me personally I take this very very seriously because there is you know Marymount's a, a great business and a great asset in the community I personally like having a college That's in the absolutely. city it's one of the jewels um, of our community you know and they've come a long way and they're really you know they're moving forward on a lot of different fronts and then you've got residents that have been here for you know decades uh, that also have an interest in what's going on over there. So we're going to take all this data, assimilate it, and, and again, what my goal is at all times is to provide not only governance but good governance, take in all the facts, all the opinions, and come up with the best decision possible for, for the residents of Rancho Palos Verdes. So in the best case scenario for Marymount watching, when, when do you think this will be resolved? I mean, this is something that they'll know be by summertime or? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I, you know, there, the, Dr. Brophy actually asked me at the close if I can specify a date certain which we can get this done. And I really couldn't do that because I didn't know how many right. comments we were going to get and, and uh, how in depth and, and what kind of analysis would be needed. But, uh, you know, the goal is to try and get it done sometime in March. We're sensitive to their timing, and I think that we can get it done sometime in March. Okay. Yeah. Well, stay tuned for that one. Right. Next time we have you on here, we'll have some more answers on that. Absolutely. Um, there's a changing of a guard happening at City Hall. The city manager, Karen Lair, announced she'd be stepping down after seven years, which was a long run for a city manager as Absolutely. you research how long they usually typically stay in a city, three or four years. So we've had her here for a right. while. 
And um, so just talk about what will happen <coughs> with the transition, um, the process that now you're going to go through as a council for a search for a new city manager. Absolutely. Well, in December, uh, Carolyn Lair notified the city council that she would not be <coughs> requesting that her contract be renewed. Her contract expires in June, June 30th of this year. And that will be exactly about the seven-year marker, which is unprecedented for city managers. Usually it's around three years. You know, they, they either get burnt out or their, their welcome is... Uh, uh, you know, used up at that point, if you will, and, and uh, but she's she's been here a long time, and I do want to acknowledge and thank Carolyn for all of her hard work. Uh, you know, she did put her heart into this, and she was a, a good representative of the of the city publicly. Uh, she worked very hard at what she did, and you know, there were a lot of accomplishments that, that transpired under under her watch. You know, you had Terranea came to fruition and completion. Uh, we San got Ramon. we we got yeah. we got hundreds of new acre uh, new acreage in the in the preserve, if not you know, thousands of acres and trails during her tenure. Um, Storm Dame projects, you just said San Ramon, that's a big one. We also had McCarroll Canyon during that time frame. And we also had, um, you know, the implementation of the, the Storm Drain user fee and the, the governance thereof. So there was a lot that went on there. And I'm just, I'm just scratching the surface. So personally, I want to thank Carolyn for mm -hmm. her service. And I think the, the city, you know, owes her a debt of gratitude for her leadership during this tenure, regardless of what your feelings are on what transpired during that seven years. She did it. Right. She worked very hard at it. But uh, so we got notice in December. Um, at that point in time, the council, along with the city attorney, worked to come up with a transition plan. Obviously, there there are legal issues associated with that. Um, we we came up with a plan. We came up with a separation agreement to to discuss and outline how we were going to move forward. Part of that was um, basically on the 30th, 31st of January, Carolyn is going to step away from the day-to-day -day duties. Uh, February 1st, Carolyn Petru, our deputy city manager, is going to step in as interim city manager or acting city manager. Uh, and by the way, we're going to be very well served. Um, by Carolyn Petri. She's got almost, you know, 30 years of service. She's been held almost every senior position there is. Uh, very smart, very capable. My number one goal, and again, the number one goal of the council was to ensure continuity, um, to ensure um, that, that services continue at a very high level. And I'm extremely confident that under Carolyn Petru's uh, guidance that that will continue and that, you know, staff morale and things along those lines will, will stay at a very high level. Right. Um, <clears throat> at that point, I just brought forward at the last council meeting during the study session the topic of the recruitment, basically uh, going out and looking for a new city manager. We have to formalize that. We want to talk about that publicly, so we need to get it on the agenda. Uh, that was brought forward in a study session. I will have some preliminary meetings with, uh, with our HR people, Sean Robinson, um, but very, very, just to, you know, give you a succinct uh, discussion about the process, we will in all likelihood uh, engage a consultant, a, a headhunter, if you will, uh, that will assist us. And that's normally the way it's done. There are companies that specialize in, in city managers, believe it or mm -hmm. not, uh, that we will likely engage one of those to help us. But we're gonna, we're gonna figure out exactly if there's any changes in the qualifications of the city manager we want. Uh, that process may take three, six, nine months, may take up to a year. But again, I'm, I'm comfortable that, that we're in good hands. Um, with Carolyn Petru and with this council helping out and with the senior staff that we have at City Hall. Um, so it could be up to a year. We could just be up to a year. Other communities right on the hill. We had Rolling Hills switched out and right. PVE. So yeah, they a lot of changes they, on they, the peninsula. They move with, around with a little management. bit. And it, and it really depends, you know, how many candidates step forward and mm -hmm. whether or not we can negotiate a deal. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of uh, intangibles there that are going to have to work themselves out. Okay. Well, well, again, you'll just keep update us, updating we'll keep us on the updated. process and Absolutely. let us know. So anybody out there that's watching, that's interested in applying, that's it's right. open. In very short order, that will be made public and, uh, you know, the criteria will be there and the qualifications and that will be put forward. Okay. Also, since we're talking about <coughs> staff and changes, we have a new public works director. We do. And uh, his name is Michael Throne. Um, he is very, very well qualified. We've had a series of interim directors, and these are guys that, that have worked in that role previously, uh, primarily, and, and they've done a good job as interims, but we now have a permanent uh, public works director, and, and uh, you know, you can watch the last meeting. His, quali his qualifications are impeccable. Mm -hmm. You know, an engineer by trade public works on a very large scale. Uh, he is really, really, and I've had several meetings with him thus far. He is a... a, a a gentleman and extremely well qualified and we're lucky to have him. 
All right, and he's coming in right at the tail end of the city's biggest infrastructure project yet, San Ramon. I don't know if you want to take this moment to kind of update us in San sure. Ramon. And it, Does that work for you? Yeah, yeah it works for me. Know. You know, San Ramon, um, as a matter of fact, Michael Thorne, uh, excuse me, Throne, yesterday along with a whole host of staff, uh, went on an inspection tour. They actually, the, the last leg of the, uh, of the um, drain system, if you will, the tunneling has been completed, and they're just about the, the upper 2,000 feet uh, is about to uh, have the pipe placed within the tunnel. They had to dig the tunnel. You've got the tunnel and they secure the tunnel and then they come in and insert the pipe in afterwards. So you actually got a, a duplicate structure there and uh, they went on a uh, inspection actually walking up the highest part of the San Ramon project in the tunnel to, to actually look at it. And I was going to go on that, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. Well, we need to go. We'll bring our RPV TV camera crew. We'll go. You know, that, <laughs> that would be good. I think Let's the... Take, <coughs> take our, bring our viewers inside that tunnel. It's I'm funny, ready. It's funny you say that, and I'm not sure if you can do that anymore, because now that the tunnel, they're, they're actually starting to place pipe in there, and that Ooh. changes the dynamic there. So we might have better missed an opportunity on that. Yeah, you better call very quickly, because I think we're... I think, okay. I think today was D-Day on that, because they started right. placing pipe. And, okay. We're on track, we're on schedule, um, all the excavation has been done. We're looking at an April close, an April finish date. We're looking at being on budget uh, and on time. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, the contractor has, has done a great job and I drive by there two, three times a day to and from work and, you know, just watching it is amazing. And actually, I am gonna go on a tour on, on not in, in the pipes, but externally again to okay. see what's going on. So oh, maybe we can do that That would together. be great. And yeah. you talked about it on time and on budget. It's a $20 million project about that, right? Yeah, it's, it's going to be a little, hopefully it'll be a little bit less than that. We're, we're looking at somewhere 18 plus or minus and, you know, with the with the uh, contingency overrides, it could be up to as much as $20 million, Right. And hopefully not. I know half of it was from a state state money and then what happened with the other half state money the the rest of the money is coming out of our cip budget that's it's coming happened. the city's going to pay for that and that's another thing that we have coming up is um as part of our infrastructure management plan we're going to look at funding of these projects specifically one of the items is san ramon uh whether or not we want to either finance some of it part of it or none of it um, but we're also going to step back and take a macro look we've got a whole host of issues on you know, the, the storm drain user fee is, is sunsetting in 2016, so we've got, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of projects that we're going to have to address one way or another, so that's going to come up. And we may look at that globally and see if, if debt financing or some sort of financing uh, is appropriate. Well, our next show, I want to talk about a lot of those projects like El Tamara Canyon, the Bumpy Road. You know what might be good is when we get that when we get that infrastructure management plan, and that that again may be 60 days out or so. But we're going to get the report card, which will be eye-opening for a lot of people because they went and looked at our entire every you know buildings, parks, uh, city facilities, infrastructure, storm drains, sewers, all this stuff, and they went in there and actually graded it based on on other comparable cities to come up with the grade and give us some guidance moving forward. And based on that report card, uh, we will come up with this management program, which will again use our very, very qualified staff plus consultants to tell us this is what you need to plan on going well into the future. So that report card, are you projecting that we won't be passing in every area? Um, <laughs> certain areas will be stellar and certain areas will need some work, absolutely. We'll need some tutoring. I don't think we're going to be a straight A student. <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's where we're going to we're going to work with that. Right. Um, back to when we were talking about some of the things going on with staffing at City Hall with the mm -hmm. new public works director. What's happening with the um, rank and file members with the union negotiations? What's going on mm. there? Right. Well, as you know, we had a uh, the the rank and file uh, employees formed a union. I think it's it's well over a year now. Mm -hmm. uh, the first step in that process, and we've talked about this several times, is. Um, coming up with what they call a status quo memorandum of understanding or otherwise known as an MOU. And it's status quo because once the union is formed by law, <clears throat> whatever the policies, procedures, and processes are at the city, whether codified, written down or not, or if it's just a, a, a known practice, is where you start from. That is, that is where Everybody expects, meaning the rank and file, this is, this is where we are today. And if somebody wants to change something, meaning the union wants to change something, negotiate something, time off, pay, working conditions, policies and procedures, you've got to start somewhere. So we're in the process of coming up with the initial or status quo MOU. So both parties, meaning the city and the union, can agree, here's where we are. 
and we're still working through that process. It's taken a little longer than, than we wanted, but that's neither here nor there. It's taken longer. Sometimes you have to walk before you can run. That's right. <laughs> and there, there's a whole host of reasons why it took longer, but we will, we will uh, get through that. And then once that's done, we will have what, what's referred to as a, an MOU or a collective bargaining agreement. And from that point, negotiations will begin. And when you say we the city, is this to, are all the council members part of this team? Who does this negotiating? Uh, we have external counsel that is expert in uh, municipal negotiations from a management side. So it's, it's not adversarial. We have the city, which is management side, and then the employees, which is the, the employee side. Mm -hmm. So we have two parties. They have representation, which includes attorneys and, and experts in negotiation, uh, as does the city. You know, we're not experts on, on labor negotiations. And uh, I was a, a staunch advocate for ensuring that we had um, the best representation out there because we're not only starting negotiations now, but we're, we're setting the groundwork right. and the framework going well into the future. Um, you know, people don't realize that these different bargaining units, as they're called, you have the rank and file employees, you know, the temporary employees, the even senior management can form unions under California law. So we need to do this right. Um, and, and not only for, for us now, but for, for the city going forward well into the future. And most cities of this size do have employee associations. Absolutely, yeah, they do. So. It's not unusual. And Anyways. again, we weren't experts, and we're becoming experts, though. <laughs> Another thing to add to your plate. That's right. Okay. Um, big topic, always number one priority for you is helping to run the city, would be crime prevention, keeping us residents safe. Right. Why don't you uh, bring us up to speed what's happening with there with our safety and, and crime? Give us well, a crime update. Well, public safety, as I said, is job one, uh, not only for this city, but for most every city. Um, I want to point out that we have... Every week we get an administrative report put out by the city manager along with staff and in this particular um, administrative report dated January 22nd, two days ago, it has all the preliminary crime statistics that are put forward by the Sheriff's Department. I do want to, to thank and, and note and praise our Sheriff's Department. They do a great job. Uh, they made some very significant arrests over the course of the last six or eight months. Um, some burglary rings that dispensing with those handful of criminals will should cut down you know they were responsible for a lot of crime um, but in general I want to state too we have a very safe city we have a, a low crime city uh, some of the statistics might make you think otherwise um, but I can tell you our, our you know violent crimes are, are static or down uh, property crimes crimes of opportunity are on the increase and again there's a lot of reasons for that uh, we had the realignment, AB 109, um, that, that mandated how many prisoners that the state can have in jail and then and diverting some of the, the jailing to counties versus state. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why, and, and there's overcrowding, so they have to let people go earlier. And there's a lot of studies that, that there's a direct correlation, not so much on violent crime, but on property crimes associated with this realignment project. And I can tell you, and I'll give you some of the color commentary here, but uh, uh, property crimes are up. Larceny, you know, um, primarily break-ins into cars, uh, smash and grab, people leaving their cars unlocked, people leaving valuables in their car, that's up tremendously. And, and then one that I thought was found very interesting uh, is auto theft and motorcycle theft is up tremendously. And I'm just going to give you a couple is of these. Is that just in our city? Around in the our city, yeah. We have, it's, well... Yeah. We are statistically in line with the increases and decreases within the county, but we have city-specific statistics here. And, and again, let me just give you some of these, some highlights here, you know. Homicide, there's been no change. We had zero there. Um, you know, rape is a very, that's been consistent. It's a very small number. It's, it's, it's I think we, there was one on here from in the last two years. But uh, robbery is actually... Uh, down from five years ago when these are they're doing a comparison five year to one year so it's actually up from one year ago but down from five years ago uh, assaults are down 30 percent um, you know burglaries are actually in Rancho Palos Verdes uh, up 25 percent from five years ago and up five percent from one year ago so there is there's been an increase in that particular area. Larceny theft, which is again breaking into cars and what have you, that's up 24%. Grand theft auto is up just under 79%. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. And that includes motorcycles and what have you. Arson, no change. 
Um, but overall, and uh, you know, the crimes total, the, the, the statistics are somewhat skewed in my opinion because you have the high number of the, uh, the property theft and, and the grand theft auto. So it looks like you know, crime's up technically 13% uh, year over year and up 22% from five years ago. But let me say again, we have a very, very low crime uh, city, very, very safe city. We've got uh, excellent, excellent uh, sheriff service and, and people should feel safe and feel good about their community. Right. And we'll, we'll muddle through this stuff and you know, we'll, we may have to reach out to some of the state and the county. And but a big part too is as a residents, we have to continue to be proactive. I just know with our own neighborhood watch where we're in Seaview, right. still not feel like there's not a day that goes by that I'm not seeing something from um, Erica Barber, who's our neighborhood watch. That's right. She that does says, a great job, Erica. That <laughs> says, you know, that there was a car broken into. Right. I, I mean, I've been in our neighborhood now since 98, and I mm -hmm. see that those emails are coming a little more frequently. But the sure. main thing is now I'm not leaving my stuff in my car, which I used to. I think we all had our guard down here for so long. That is, that is the biggest challenge in their crimes of opportunity. If you have nothing in your car, they're not going to break right. into your car, other if they want to steal your car now. That's a different, mm -hmm. you know, but, but most of the time you have these crimes of opportunity. Somebody's going hiking, they leave the door open, or they either laptop or purse. You know, these guys look in there, look on the floor. If you throw it under your mat, they see it and they're going to break your window and get to it. So, right. so but you're on it and uh, our, we have our you guys meet with the count with the sheriff's department regularly and that's right we meet with the sheriff's department and there's a there's a peninsula wide um, you know group that the, the cities get together and talk about crime issues so we're we're, we're on top of it and again I want to say I'm we, I'm I'm comfortable we live in a very safe yeah. community it could get better and and people can do a lot to protect themselves you know close your windows you know don't leave stuff in your car that's the biggest thing I hear over and over and mm -hmm. over and I know it comes to Captain Bolin and the team over there, they're trying to, you know, do all they can with their resources. I know there's always some concern sometimes about response times. I'm always, you can always, there's room for improvement, right? And, but you were just recently commending about what happened with that, say, for example, the missing teen that was just up off Ganado. That's right. The way they handled that. And yeah, I was, I was very impressed with that, and I, am, I continue to be impressed. That, just to give you a little color on that particular issue, I was at, at a meeting with some residents on Ganado, and was actually driving home and I saw four sheriff's cars um, on the side of the road and another car, a command post, a sheriff vehicle and I pulled over to see what was going on, uh, spoke to them and they told me that, that you know, a young girl, a 17 year old had gone missing uh, and I asked them, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, we have, you know, they had a whole map there, they had it laid out and they had her picture and all these different things and um, they said they contacted the uh, neighborhood watch, uh, Gail Lorenzen, to get the word out. They also were contacting the city manager to let them know. And so then I talked to the mother over there who was obviously very distraught and a couple of her siblings. And I said, well, you know, there's another thing that we can do that we not, don't normally do. And I'm going to talk to the city manager if you're okay with this. We have the listserv system. And that system is, sends out emails on specific topics that residents can sign up for, be it Marymount or Abalone Cove or breaking news. And there were several thousand people that can be contacted on that system. Now, it's a little out of the norm uh, to use that for something like this, but it was an unusual situation where, you know, we had a 17-year-old girl that was getting dark. Uh, by the way, there was no foul play involved. Mm -hmm. no, one, no, one, no one suspected foul play. Uh, that's neither here nor there. We wanted to find her, and, and she wound up um, being gone all night. She was found the next morning, interestingly enough, by a neighborhood watch area coordinator who had been noted that, that this was going on on some of the trails and was able to bring her back home. But one thing I do want to point out is we did use the listserv and sent that information out. And I think any parent or anybody, I don't think anyone b would begrudge us from Not doing that. Not at all. That, that was okay. very effective. People were thankful to get that it notice. Was, it was so effective. And what it did too, and I mentioned this at the council meeting, Liz, is I was so proud of what happened. There were, there were so many people that started sending emails saying, I'm going out driving. This is the area I covered. I actually did it myself, you know, because I was very concerned and distraught about this. I drove around until about one in the morning personally and covered a big, big, you know, swath of the hill. Um, but I wasn't alone in that, and it really was heartwarming. And what kind of community? We're a large city, you know, by, by area, and even by population. You know, we, we think we're small, but, you know, there are a lot smaller cities than us. But we still have that small community feel, and people step, didn't even know this girl. Mm -hmm. and, and got out there and drove around and reported back to Gail, hey, Gail, I covered this area, didn't see anything, told so-and-so, and they were out doing that. So. Very, very proud, very heartwarming. Thank God she was found. And, and again, no foul play involved. So, you know, we're, we're a in a safe city. There. Happy ending, absolutely. And when you put stuff out on the listserv, it also goes up right <coughs> on RPV TV. So we have that community bulletin board that 
goes into you know tens That's of right. thousands of homes when you're a Cox subscriber. You, That's you right. That. No, so, RPV did step up. Yeah, RPV that was good TV. that we can do Terrific. that. Terrific. Yeah, so, thank you. As we sort of wrap it up here, um, anything else you want to share the last month's things that you've accomplished as a council? I know you always at the end of the meetings, you give your reports, so you do a lot of stuff beyond the meeting. So. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of different things that uh, the other day there was uh, a, uh, the chamber had what they call their economic forum and they bring in a couple of guest speakers. It was also the, the uh, installation of their new board of directors and I was very happy to be involved in that installation. Uh, program. I installed Alan Bond, who's now the chairman of the board mm -hmm. of the chamber, and he's a longtime uh, Rancho Palos Verdes resident. So, uh, congratulations again, Alan. And it was very, very well attended. If somebody, you know, wants to see what's going on in the business community, and, and you know, we're known as a limited business community compared to some cities, but we have a very, very involved chamber, and the chamber's peninsula wide, so you get a lot of it. It was great to see so many All people right. there, very well attended. Eileen Hupp does a great job as, she does. as in charge of that, and they are everywhere, and it is a great networking opportunity, and Absolutely. They, just, they do a lot, and I guess they had, were they at Terranea for that event? Terranea, again, you know, what, what a venue, and, and I was so happy to welcome everyone to Rancho Palos Verdes, and Terranea, and it was a, you know, 79 degree day starting off, it was beautiful. And we, what it was, another beautiful event coming up, we want to remind our viewers about, mm -hmm. um, that you'll be there, of course, with kids and family, I'm sure, and all the council whale of a day i mean how we already we're in, getting into february here so we need to remind everyone coming it's up in very short order the that's first the, saturday of the month it's always at which yeah, is march first that's right and it, that's a terrific event and we we've been coming there for years and we grab as many kids as we can and bring them over and you're kind enough to indulge them when yeah we, when we, we have a good time over. i think you told me every time i had to ever <laughs> see the whales i think you said you look up at the wrong time that's <laughs> right yeah. yeah but we've had a big run of whales recently oh. and you know that's the sightings are unbelievable the orcas you know nine miles off the coast and having we, a, having a meal close to the shore over here we are know? so we are just so lucky to have that i mean it was, to be able to see the whales with the naked eye that there's such a vantage point from that spot at pvic and, and not only the whales just the sea life in general you know my wife and i and we get a big thrill the other day we were looking and she every the kids grabbed the binoculars there must have been two thousand dolphins just jumping you see the yeah. water splashing and you get up close and it's you know dolphins jumping out. you just time. don't see that every day it's just we very blessed to yeah. to have this this where we live and have the opportunity to see nature at its best. For you right now, as you're you know heading into the beginning of the year, what do you see as the like, most exciting challenge? We'll say for you. Wow, most up. exciting <laughs> challenge. I was just going to say challenge. We want you know it to be exciting. It doesn't have to be. Well, you know, we we've got a lot of challenges, and I, I just want to say, as far as uh, you know, me personally, my biggest challenge is um, I want to serve all residents. Okay, and, and we have issues, again, when I said earlier, reasonable people can disagree reasonably. Um, but my biggest concern is, and, and we have a very involved residency and constituency, uh, business-wise and, and residence-wise, resident-wise, um, and you have people on different sides of an issue, and they come forward and they plead their case and they give you all this data and information. And my biggest challenge is to make sure that people understand that me personally, and I'm sure my colleagues also, we, we want good governance, and we do take what they say very seriously. And I'm always concerned that somebody thinks that we didn't take into consideration what they said, or they were dismissed, or um, you know, given short shrift, as it were. And, and we're not like that. We really do take what people say. I welcome it. I want it. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, some people are going to be happy, and some people aren't going to be happy. So um, right. that that's a that's a it's a it's a challenge for me because I like to, you know, make sure that our residents are happy and satisfied with their city government. Sometimes you can't, you can't get there. Right. You can't make everybody happy all the time. And we try. People though. have to remember, though, that as council people, you all live here, and obviously, you want to do the right thing by That's the right. people. And is, this is your home too. So yeah, we have. And there's just people that are skeptical of government, no matter what you do or say. And so you have to be able to kind of. And that's read through all that completely understandable and you know obviously there there are a lot of stories out there that 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 back up those those fears mm -hmm. you know you just said we can enumerate all the different right. things that go on and i'm not going to do that but you know i'm happy to say too again i'm just a segue here rpv you know we had the uh, um management partners assessment in 08 we just did the matrix is coming right. up i just spent i had a meeting last night with councilwoman brooks on the matrix report, so here's one of those things we spent three hours going over with staff every one of those items and making assessments. And I could tell you, you know, we're not perfect, but you know, the city, the city is run well. Uh, we have the systems in place. 
we have good staff and and are we, can we get better yes and we're going to get better and and the matrix report again although not perfect uh, brought forward a lot of issues that we've already taken care of and that we're going to do in the future and, and we're just going to continue to get better. We like that. Yeah. And as we start to wrap it up, um, we're going to start a new fun thing with you now that you'll be doing the show with me through the year. We thought it's always good to give a history lesson, mm, okay. especially about the city. So we decided that uh, we'll have a, we're not going to call it Stump the Mayor because you'll probably <laughs> know all these answers, but a question that we can throw out to the viewers if they email me and I'm, I just want to give my email with the sure. right answer. The first person to email me at lizb at rpv.com. So that's lizb at rpv.com with the answer to the question that the mayor is going to ask. Then we'll send you, um, we're, like you mentioned, we're, our RPV TV mug and pen just oh, for that's, fun. That's so, so that you wonderful. can drink your coffee while you watch our shows. Because we're so entertaining here. Beautiful. So, what's the question? Uh, You're going to let you come up with the first let's question. Let's come up with the first question. We'll make it a little interesting. How about uh, not who is the first mayor? How about who is the second mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes? You have so, to put your thinking caps on on that one. The so second mayor. Come up with, let us know who is the second mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes. Do you already know? I do. I think I, I do. know. Yeah. So, um, but you can't email in. <laughs> um, no, your, your, your emails are timestamped, so we can make sure that yeah. this is a fair So contest. the first person yeah. to email me, and also we want to, we try to encourage our community to like, we want feedback to it out here at the studio and let us know what you like and stories you got that you want us to cover in the community. We're here. This is paid by the taxpayers, our PVTV, and we want to be there and, and do things that they're interested in us covering. So we hope to hear from you. And again, my email one more time, lizb at rpv.com. And can I say one more thing too? Sure. Um, my cell phone and my email are on the internet. If somebody has something that they want to say, I take phone calls at all hours of the night. You know, I, wow. I, I take uh, emails. I, you know, I'm happy to communicate with anybody who has something to tell me. So, so. your cell phone, you're not, we're not going to give that out here, but it's there. It's on the website. Yeah, it's very easy it. to do. Okay. They can, I'm easy to find. You know, I'm, yeah. I can't hide anymore. Yeah. And my <laughs> cell phone's also on my city business card because you just, you know, you want people to be able to reach you. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you. This was great, and we'll have you back in here next month. Well, and, thank you. And I really appreciate pleasure. the opportunity to chat, and again, you guys do a great job, and, and uh, very proud to be a part of RPV. All right. Keep, keep, keep the work up, and uh, we'll have you in here again next month. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with Mayor Jerry Dehovic. Have a great day.